In this module, we're going to go into more detail on building GLM models. This is design specification. First, let's review some key concepts from before. We talked about the structural model for the GLM, y equals x times beta plus error, where the betas are the model parameters that need to be estimated. x is the design matrix that we're going to specify in advance. That's what we're building today. We talked about an overview of the GLM analysis process, which is a two-level hierarchical model involving design specification or model building, estimation, and contrast specification and group analysis. Then we're ready for anatomical localization and inference. This is the first level of GLM for a single voxel and a single subject, a basic design matrix. What we care about here is the activation parameter estimate, or the beta, for the task regressor in a very simple design. If we go from two conditions of interest to more than two conditions, we can specify any number of different event types or block types. Here we've got four, A, B, C, and D. Convolve each of them with an assumed basis function and end up with a design matrix. So let's look now at model building. And we'll look specifically at multiple predictors and at contrasts. So let's go back to our famous versus non-famous face example. It's a block design. What we care about is the difference between famous and non-famous faces. This is a contrast across those two conditions. With a block design, one can use a single regressor that captures that difference and just build it into our model. That's what we saw previously. But what happens if we have an event-related design? We have to model each event type separately in the GLM. Now we end up with a design matrix that has one regressor for famous and one regressor for non-famous faces. In this case, we can flexibly test multiple contrasts on this design matrix. So we can assess the difference uh, between famous and non-famous faces, we can assess each one separately, or we can assess their average. These functions are specified by different linear contrasts across those parameter estimates or betas. So what is a contrast? It's a flexible and powerful tool for testing a priori hypotheses in a GLM framework. We'll focus now specifically on T contrasts, which is a linear combination of GLM parameters that gives us a single plan contrast. I can do a T test on that and make a statistical inference on whether that contrast value is not zero or not. It's specified by a vector of weights, which we'll call C, so that C transpose times beta hat and beta hat means the activation parameter estimates, gives me a scalar value. This is sine. It can have negative or positive values under the null hypothesis. So let's apply that to our famous and non-famous phase example here. So I've got two parameter estimates that I'm interested in, beta 1 for famous, beta 2 for non-famous. I can specify a difference contrast, which is 0 for the intercept, 1 for the famous, and negative 1 for the non-famous phases. That gives us the famous non-famous difference. This contrast specifies the sum or average across the two face types. So this essentially gives me face versus rest. So that's zero, one for famous, one for non-famous faces. And we can test a single event. So zero, one, zero tests only the famous faces, or beta one, against the implicit intercept. And it asks, is there a significant positive or negative response to famous faces? So let's generalize this now to the case where we have multiple predictors. This will be a useful example that we'll take forward with us into future lectures as well. So here I've got a design with four conditions. And let's just say this is a memory experiment. So I've got four word types, A, B, C, and D, and they're grouped into two factors. Factor one we'll call modality, or visual versus auditory presentation. So there are two levels of that factor. Factor two is high versus low imageability. It turns out words that are imageable are easier to remember. So there's two levels of imageability in our example. And this is an example of a factorial repeated measures ANOVA design to go back to the earlier lecture. And that's because there are four or more repeated measures. We have each of the four trial types sampled within person with multiple instances per person. Um, in this case we don't have any between subject predictors yet, no individual differences. So I've just got a straight up factorial repeated measures ANOVA design. Very typical for fMRI. So let's look at model building and contrasts with multiple predictors. We'll specify our indicator function for four different types of onsets, convolve it with the basis function, the assumed HRF, uh, then we get the design matrix. 
So this is exactly the case that we saw previously. And in general, if you're modeling any kind of factorial design in fMRI, you can simply create one regressor or one event type per cell. <laughs> now let's look, use this to look at contrasts. <clears throat> so these are my four columns of my design matrix, and now I'm going to apply contrast weights across those four columns. I can apply the contrast 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1, which means I'm taking a linear combination that equals the parameter estimate for column A plus B minus C plus D. And you can see this graphically here down below. This is a main effect of factor 1, or visual versus auditory presentation. Let's look at some rules for t-contrast now, and this can help us elaborate our understanding of contrast. So first of all, C can be a matrix. It doesn't have to be one contrast value, it can be several. And if C is arranged in columns so that each column is a contrast vector, those columns are applied independently, so they don't affect one another. So each is really a separate test uh, of a separate effect on the data. So let's look at this contrast matrix. It's got three columns. And this contrast matrix corresponds to the main effects in interaction, or the standard ANOVA contrasts. So let's look at those three columns a little bit more carefully. The first column is 0 0.5, 0 0.5, negative 0.5, negative 0.5. So this reflects the main effect of factor 1. So I've got positive weights on A and B, negative weights on C and D. The second column reflects the main effect of factor 2. Now I've got positive weights on A and C, negative weights on B and D. And finally, the third column reflects the interaction, which is what I get when I multiply the contrast weights for those two columns together to create the third column. And now, this column essentially captures the crossover interaction. Uh, so I've got positive weights on A and D, negative weights on B and C. And this is testing the effect that the effect of factor 1 depends on the level of factor 2, or vice versa. <clears throat> I'm not limited to ANOVA contrasts. I can specify plan tests that make sense based on whatever hypotheses I might have. So in this case, the contrast 1, negative 1, 0, 0 is testing a simple effect, or the difference between A and B. This might be of interest. In this case, it's testing high versus low imageability effect for visual items only which is a very sensible thing to test depending on my psychological questions. This contrast, negative 2, negative 1, negative 1, 0, tests something else. This tests the, the magnitude of twice A versus B and C together. So this may or may not make sense depending on my design, but this is a valid contrast. And in some cases, it might be useful. <laughs> Another rule is about scaling. So the scaling of the weights, the contrast weights, affects the magnitude of the contrast values, but not the inferences I make. So it doesn't affect the t-values or the p-values. So I can use contrast weights of 1, negative 1, or 0.5, negative 0.5, and get the exact same statistical result. So let's look at this case, where I've got this contrast 2, negative 1, negative 1, and this is twice a versus b versus minus b minus c. And if I rescale the contrast weights to be 1, negative 0.5, negative 0.5, 0, then the contrast value estimates A versus the mean of B and C. If these were four different sports teams, and I was testing memory effects of football players, hockey players, baseball players, and basketball players, you can see why you might want to test football players versus the average of hockey and basketball players, for example. So depending on what my question is, this can be quite useful. And here's one tip as we move forward. Contrast weights must be the same for all participants to keep all the participants' estimates on the same scale. And one way you can get into trouble is if you have missing sessions or runs. If you use contrast weights of, of ones and negative ones across the runs, they may not be on the same scale. We'll hear more about that in the second course. <laughs> Another rule for decontrast is that the contrast weights typically sum to zero. And this makes it so the expected value of the contrast under the null hypothesis is zero. And that permits us to do a t-test where zero is the null hypothesis value. So it's very natural. Let's consider a contrast C across four conditions. Here's a valid contrast, negative two, negative one, negative one. The contrast weights sum to zero. <laughs> this contrast is not valid. Contrast is negative two, negative one, zero, zero. 
this tests 2 times a minus b. But even if the beta values are random, I'm going to get some non-zero value for the contrast estimate. And that means I'm not sure what the null hypothesis value should be for a t-test. There is an exception. So the exception is that I can test the average of one or more conditions against the implicit baseline. So if I test the contrast 1, 0, 0, 0, then that contrast value is testing the significance of the beta value for condition A only. So essentially whether the response to A is, is different than 0. The contrast 1, 1, 0, 0 tests the sum or the average beta for A and B. In our example, this would be uh, for all the visually presented events, for example. One final note before we move forward. We looked at model building for multiple predictors. Looks like this. And let's just very quickly remind ourselves that there are a number of assumptions that we have to make. To build this model, I have to assume that the neural activity function is correct, little sticks or blocks. We have to assume that the HRF is correct, and we have to assume a linear time invariant system. These three assumptions together allow me to construct the design matrix. All of these assumptions are wrong to some degree. Uh, some models, all models are wrong, but some are useful, as the statistician George Box once said. Uh, and we'll look at how to relax some of these assumptions in certain ways in later lectures. That's the end of this module. Thanks. Mm.